किसी का और प्रेजेंट है इसमें लोड करेंगे इस पर ही लोड करेंगे सबका इसमें है क्योंकि ठीक है शायद किसी का प्रेजेंटेशन नहीं है ओके सर मेरा यही है ठीक है बस ऐसे ही रहने वाला ठीक That knowing that this is a topic that affects so many people and we do know that in the audience we have some here people with some very specific knowledge and some specific questions and things to raise on this general subject so we want to make sure that we have a good interactive session with you with the various panelists and we really explore this quite fascinating and quite complex subject um, this is a session on the transboundary internet and we talk about jurisdiction control and sovereignty. And our rationale for the work, well, to, uh, our workshop started as follows, that the internet crosses the boundaries of all nations and raises some unique transboundary jurisdiction problems. And we raised the case of a British citizen who's living in Spain and um, has a website and um, it's got servers located in the Bahamas. And this particular person sells holidays to Cuba. That's what he does for his business on his website. Now, his website was taken down because the registry for his website was located in the United States where they don't like holidays to Cuba. So it actually contravened US law, although perhaps nobody else's, but US law sort of came in to apply there. So there's an interesting example. Um, in the world of Google and YouTube, and um, we're fortunate to have um, Rishi from Google here, um, there are some fascinating examples as well. Uh, another one I'd mention is that um, the Pakistani government ordering a block on offensive content um, uh, to Google, who are headquartered in the USA, it was material by a Dutch politician who was publishing cartoons from a Danish newspaper which offended to many Islamic people. And that's just one example. There are many more. And these are the sort of issues and um, you know, sort of examples that come up. And we talk and we raise here as the possibilities for discussion, um, uh, jurisdiction, and control and sovereignty are the three words that we bring up. Um, and they're interesting words in themselves. Why jurisdiction? Does it really matter who does this? And does it matter who responds as long as somebody does if there's an issue? I think it does, because if jurisdiction is clear, isn't clear, there's two things go on. One is people quarrel about who should be in charge. But the other one, and perhaps more importantly for many of us, as a consumer, where are my rights protected if the jurisdiction is not clear or there is no jurisdiction for me in my local area? So when we talk jurisdiction and control, and there we might have issues of industry self-regulation and so on, and sovereignty, I think there's some fascinating examples. I'm extremely pleased to be joined by a very expert panel here that's going to be able to give you the background to this. I can raise questions, but I'm not an expert in them. Let me just introduce briefly, and I'll give you more information later on, but Miriam Mizuki. Miriam's from the European Digital Rights Commission and the National Centre for Scientific Research at the University of Pierre and Marie Curie in France. Um, uh, that's Miriam, and we have Miriam Shapiro, uh, Miriam is the president of the Summary Strategies International, has worked a lot on international law issues, worked for the Clinton administration, is a member of the Obama transition team, and is an expert on international legal issues. So her input's going to be fantastic. Let me also introduce Rishi Jaitley. Have I pronounced that right? Yeah. Sounds good. Good enough? <laughs> 
Um, Rishi is the South Asia Government Affairs Manager for Googling, so that gives us the sort of input from Google. So we've got industry, we've got government, we've got legal, we've got um, human rights issues, we've got all of that too. Um, uh, we should be joined shortly by Bill Drake. Bill, as um, many of you will know, is um, uh, quite a well-known commentator on internet governance issues with um, the GigaNet International Academic Research as well as the Internet Governance Caucus. And we have also, in absentia, um, a statement which I will perhaps start by reading out from you. And this is from the Council of Europe, who co-sponsored this workshop with us. Um, you may or may not know that the Council of Europe decided um, as a whole that they would not be able to attend Hyderabad, which is a great pity. They were very kind, and they've sent us here a statement. I have to look this way and face that way, so I hope the sound picks this up, but this is from Andrew McIntosh. Andrew's the chairman of the subcommittee on media of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and he's a member of the um, House of Lords in London. Uh, this is his statement, and yeah, this is by way of introduction to the workshop. Um, Andrew says, I deeply regret that I cannot participate on behalf of the Council of Europe in this workshop because it deals with one of the most important questions of this Internet Governance Forum. When we speak of internet governance, we presuppose that the internet is not an anarchic space, but a medium which can be government. This world has produced different notions of government, ranging from the Darwinist theory of the survival of the fittest to philosophies of enlightenment, democracy and human rights. The internet I personally would wish to see should be based on the latter model of governance. By its technical nature, the internet is an international transboundary network of computers allowing data exchanges National borders do not seem to play any role in the cyberspace. The internet is, however, used by humans living in a real world with state borders and laws giving rights and imposing obligations. I'm a British citizen. Let's imagine I go on the internet in Hyderabad and participate in a discussion forum on a website created by a Japanese citizen based in Dubai, which is hosted by a service provider from France. Where will I be held liable for the text and pictures I contribute to that discussion forum? Which laws and rules control the discussion forum? <coughs> Criminal law jurisdiction. The most severe control of human behaviour is achieved through criminal law. It's therefore of utmost importance to clarify the jurisdiction under criminal law. In principle, criminal jurisdiction could be established at the place of the criminal act by the nationality of a possible, possible victim as well as by the nationality of the perpetrator. The latter seems to be clear in my case, but there might be some others aiding and abetting. For instance, the creator of the website or the internet service provider. Looking at the first criterion, the place of the criminal act, we face even more uncertainty in the case I mentioned. This place is traditionally the place of a physical act or the place where the effect of that act is realised. Posting text and a picture from Hyderabad on the World Wide Web, and we make them accessible all over the world. Even if we can't escape jurisdiction of at least one country, how shall the law enforcement authorities of that country collect evidence? And my apologies, I don't sound like a member of the British House of Lords, but um, <laughs> I will do the best <laughs> to read their statement. So continuing on, and this is the statement from the Council of Europe. The convention is, and let me at this point of time welcome our um, uh, rapporteur, Bill Drake. Very pleased to have you here. Sorry, the other panel didn't end. Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> no reason. Um, so... Uh, Yes. Lawyers have thought about such problems already several years ago when a group of international experts drafted the Cyber Crime Convention of 2001. This work was done at the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, but its geographic scope was always global. So, the Convention is the first international treaty on crimes committed via the internet and other community networks dealing particularly with infringement of copyright, computer-related fraud, child pornography and violations of network security. It also contains a series of powers and procedures such as the search of computer networks and interception. Its main objective, set out in the preamble, is to pursue a common criminal law policy aimed at the protection of society against cybercrime, especially by adopting appropriate legislation and fostering international cooperation. 
The Convention aims particularly um, at one, harmonising national criminal offences in the area of tribal crime, and two, providing for national criminal procedural laws the power necessary for the investigation and prosecution of such offences, as well as other offences committed in relation to a computer system, and three, setting up a fast and effective regime of international cooperation. The following offences are defined by the Convention. Illegal access, illegal interception, data interference, system interference, misuse of devices, computer-related forgery, computer-related fraud, offences related to child pornography and offences related to copyright and neighbouring rights. It also sets out procedural law issues as expedited preservation of stored data, expedited preservation and partial disclosure of traffic data, production order, search and seizure of computer data, real-time collection of traffic data and interception of content data. In addition, the con Convention sets up a permanent network for ensuring speedy assistance amongst the contracting parties. Contracting parties of the Cybercrime Convention will have a clear notion of their state's jurisdictional sovereignty and control. Without such international rules, internet users will face problems and uncertainties. This convention is also open to accession by non-European states, all of which sit with equal rights on the committee established by the convention in order to oversee or develop further the convention. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe recommended in 2005 to initiate, for instance, work towards an additional protocol of cybercrime prevention, setting up a framework for security cooperation between states for the prevention of cyber terrorism in the form of large-scale attacks on and through computer systems that threaten a state's national security, public safety or economic well-being. I'll never get a job as a newsreader. <laughs> the terrible attacks in Mumbai last week were physical attacks on innocent people. Terrorists might also attack cyberspace, ranging from computer systems or large companies, hospitals or power plants, to railway, air traffic or defence system. Such attacks would be more than simple criminal offences and may require special provisions and advanced cooperation at international level. Do we need an additional convention at the level of the United Nations? No, because the existing Cybercrime Convention is open in principle to all UN member states. Therefore, the United Nations should endorse and support this convention and call on its member states to sign it. This should be one of the results of the IGF in Hyderabad. The current parties to the Cybercrime Convention might then consider whether an additional poll will be necessary to actually accommodate all member states. And he goes on there with um, private law jurisdiction. Questions of state sovereignty and control are less relevant in the sphere of private law. Private international law typically leaves the choice of the applicable law and competent judicial forum to the private parties entering into a contractual relationship. If I decide to participate in a discussion forum on the internet, the organiser of that discussion forum as well as the website host may demand that I agree to their choice of law or their self-imposed code of conduct and out-of-court mediation or even legal arbitration procedures. Self-regulation alone will, of course, not be an option for all cases. For commercial contracts concluded through the inter uh, internet, the question of jurisdiction and control may be answered, for instance, by the United Nations Convention on the Use of Electronic Communications in International Contracts of 2004. So, in conclusion, it's extremely important for internet users, service providers and state authorities alike to know who has jurisdiction. A lot has been developed at the international level. It's now necessary to increase the number of state parties to the existing conventions in order to enlarge their geographic scope and avoid blank spots and grey areas on the world map of the internet. So, we do thank Andrew and um, uh, the Council of Europe for that statement and that contribution which very much covers the area of cybercrime which is probably one of the areas that this workshop will look at. We'll move on to the people who have actually made it here and who are present and I'd ask Miriam um, to speak to us. Miriam is I think well known to many of you. Um, she's been involved since 1996 as an activist for the promotion of human rights in the information society. She's the president of the French NGO IRIS and of the European Digital Rights Association. Um, she was involved with the WISIS um, Human Rights Caucus. Um, she's a member of the Council Europe Group of Specialists in Human Rights. Um, she's moved with OECD and many other organisations. She's a senior researcher um, with the French National Scientific Research Centre um, and uh, very much involved also with the academic giganet and issues of internet governance. Uh, Miriam, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jan. As you uh, reminded us in your introduction, the initial idea to organize a workshop on this issue came after a discussion on the Internet Governance Caucus mailing list. 
following this case of uh, this British citizen uh, basically uh, se selling holidays to, to, to Cuba. This case happened earlier this year. However, the transboundary jurisdictional issue is being raised since the early 90s as it is consubstantial to the transboundary nature of the internet and cases uh, started to appear with the use of the internet by a large public in order to accomplish all sorts of uh, activity. So this massification of the use of the internet has led in particular on the one hand to the amplification of conflicts between competing rights like the conflict uh, between the right to information and the right to privacy, for instance, or the conflict between the right to freedom of expression and the right to human dignity. And the massification of the use of the internet has led, on the other hand, to the exacerbation of conflicts of legislation and consequently of conflicts of uh, jurisdictions. These conflicts are not new and are not specific to the internet by any mean. The conflicts of rights have been dealt with for a long time and have been solved for better or for worse by national, regional and international laws and conventions currently in place. There is actually no absolute right in any legislation at any level. Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of, on Human Rights is balanced by Article 29, for instance. And similarly, Article 10 of the European Declaration of Human Rights, uh, affirming freedom of expression, also set limits to the exercise of this freedom of, exp of expression, affirming that it carries with it duties and responsibilities. However, these restrictions are themselves subject to core decisions and to a necessity in a democratic, and to a proven necessity in a democratic uh, society. In the same way, the transboundary nature of the internet is certainly not the first or the only case of international conflicts and international transactions having extraterritorial effects and consequences. But traditionally such international, although I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> traditionally such international conflicts may be dealt with um, uh, with the rules of jurisdiction determining the competence of a given state even beyond its borders through multilateral agreements, for instance, or they may be addressed by agreement on common rule and standards, in other words, through legislation approximation. However, both means to deal with international conflicts of jurisdiction in such a globally integrated environment as the internet raise a number of issues in that they are likely to lead to serious breaches of the rule of law and to serious violations of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Without a serious redefinition of the rules of jurisdiction on the internet, the classical rules are such that any state in the world may interfere with any content on the internet, since this data, this content, can be accessed on the state territory. This is actually the very nature of the famous. And in this case, which dates back to uh, year 2000, to year 2000, uh, two French NGOs, the French Union of Jewish Students and the French League Against Racism and Antisemitism sued the company Yahoo, the American company, not Yahoo France, before French court. And they complained about pro-Nazi and Holocaust denial website which were hosted by Yahoo, and more specifically about the Yahoo auction website, which was sell selling Nazi memorabilia, all things which are prohibited under the French law. And what happened is that the French judge ordered Yahoo, a company based in the USA, 
where these activities are not against the law to take action in order to end the infringement of the French law. I won't enter in this panel into the details of this very, very long saga, but it illustrates the general competence on the internet that might be claimed by any state, France in this case. The attempts to approximate legislations, rules and standards, while seeming an appropriate solution, also raises a number of issues. First of all, this harmonization generally faces a lot of difficulties, if not impossibilities, <coughs> since legislation, after all, reflects cultural standards that differ from one country to another. For instance, it has been impossible till now to harmonize hate speech legislation. The additional protocol to the Council of Europe Convention on Cybercrime aimed to deal with such harmonization has only been signed and ratified till now by countries having already implemented such legislation and will thus never solve a Yahoo uh, case. However, on more consensual issues like the fight against online child pornography, harmonization can and has been realized, but at the expenses of some established rights and freedom. One such harmonization instrument is the Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention with its provisions on child pornography, on online child pornography. The convention was adopted in 2001 and it entered into force in 2004 with a high number of ratifications, including from non-Council of Europe member states like the USA and other countries. But first issue with these provisions is that they make internet legislation more restri restrictive than offline legislation. Actually, the convention equates a minor, a person appearing to be a minor, and a realistic image of a minor. In some country, they even consider writings, printings, drawings, literary works, and even sounds. This poses serious threats to freedom of expression and freedom of creation. Without entering into details, and I know this is very provocative, this means that major literary works like, uh, for ex example, Nabokov's uh, Lolita, now a classic of the literature, would certainly not be uh, published, at least not easily, in the current context. Another issue with these provisions is that for the purpose of harmonization of child porn law, the age of the minor is defined as 18 at the European Union level and also at the Council of Europe level, although in this latter case it may be lower, but 16 is the, the limit. However, when looking at the age of sexual consent in concerned countries, countries in the European Union, we find that it varies from 13 to 18 among the EU countries. The problem here is that when there is no abuse and when the child is over the age of sexual consent, could an image be actually considered as a child sexual abuse image? So this very provocative example shows that such harmonization of legislation often leads to the definition of the least common denominator in terms of respect of fundamental rights and freedoms. Besides the rules of jurisdiction and the approximation of legislation, another mean to deal with international transboundary issues is international cooperation among law enforcement authorities. This cooperation more and more often also involves private parties and technical mechanisms. Through liability provisions imposed to these intermediary or gatekeepers 
of the internet, they uh, become agents of the state. For instance, when required to execute data retention provisions. In terms of content regulation, the situation is even worse with the recourse to new modalities of censorship. The notice and takedown procedures lead to a kind of privatized justice. The content filtering and blocking can be made by law, but also in some country, like in the Scandinavian country, it can be made by contract. In this situation, the police is acting as a judging power. The police decide if the content is illegal or not. And the ISP, the internet service provider, is acting as the executing power, actually filtering or blocking the content. Private hotlines in many countries deal with harmful of Ill or illegal content in a total lack of transparency and accountability. The list of examples is very long, so I will stop here and maybe we will have a chance to get back to these and other examples during the discussion. But in summary, what we are facing is a heavy trend to weaken the role of the judiciary power while extending the prerogative of the, of the police and of private parties. And this even applies at national level, where obviously there is no conflict of jurisdiction, but where more and more a questionable efficiency of the regulation process and enforcement prevails on the respect for human rights and the rule of law. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you, Miriam, for um, uh, that coverage. I think what's um, clear from this is that there is a lack of government law in this area, and this becomes interesting then in the case of a company like Google, which Rishi represents here. I don't know how many of you um, read the recent article in the New York Times, quite a long article that looked at Google and how does Google determine policy in these cases. Um, and it described that there was two or three people sitting in head office who, when the Turkish government or any other government complains, have to come up with the decision somehow or other. Do they just look and see, you know, what's our financial interest here or are there other criteria? These are the sort of questions where it's actually excellent to have Rishi here because he was one of those three secret people in the middle who made these decisions. And he's worked as a policy analyst at head office. He's now the um, South Asian um, government uh, affairs manager for Google. So his experience here I think is invaluable and thank you very much. It's yours. Thank you. I've got a slide. All right. Um, uh, thank you again for uh, having me uh, at this uh, at this panel. What I'm going to do is, uh, before I begin, just want to tell you what I what I hope to convey during uh, during this brief uh, talk. And I know uh, Google's of interest to many of you here, and so there'll be lots of lots of questions. Uh, but broadly, uh, you know, our, our 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 role in a lot of these issues, um, of course, is endless. But our per my perspective coming into this will primarily center on how we think about two issues: uh, content regulation and user privacy. And content regulation often, uh, uh, from your perspective, manifests itself in the form of, uh, uh, I'll say, the word censorship. And, uh, and privacy manifests itself, pr manifests itself in the form of uh, data disclosure, user data disclosure. Now there's a long list of other ways in which the tra transboundary internet uh, uh, is relevant, but th that's how I'll, how I'll focus. Um, what I hope to do is really shed light and some clear thinking on the actual dilemma. What is the dilemma from, from a Google perspective? And, um, and also just hope, hope to shed some additional light on how do we think about this? How do we think about these two issues? Um, but first, uh, and, and those of you that have heard me speak before, always want to begin with some context. Because without context, without, a fr without the appropriate frame of mind, uh, it's hard to have these conversations constructively uh, without getting into unproductive arguments. <laughs> 
Um, so let's keep in mind uh, where what, what kind of world we uh, what kind of world we live in. The traditional world. Uh, I won't call it the old world, but the traditional world. You know, we at Google we look. I think we're going to look back on the um, 20th century. And, and view the 20th century as this sort of weird period in human existence where people just sat back and consumed content passively. Uh, human creation dwindled. We relied on a group of organized uh, leaders like film studios, uh, news channels, uh, newspapers, uh, movie, movie studios, etc., etc., to tell us what constituted culture. And uh, that's our perspective on the traditional world. Today, in what we're calling the new world, we see a world in which users are creating. And I'm obviously pre preaching to the choir here, so I don't need to spend too much time on it. But uh, you know, you, you look at basically what's happening in our view is that culture, this this amorphous thing that we refer to as culture, global culture, Indian culture, American culture, is really not not any more the result of you know, the six Hollywood blockbusters from last year or the, the best, the best uh, Bollywood song from 2008. No, it's now the result of the contributions of millions, indeed hundreds of millions of people. And so, you know, some people uh, in, in, in some generations might say, yikes, what's going on here? Uh, but in our view, this is actually something worth celebrating. I think this is a, a, a real, a really uh, a gr great development in, in the human story, where we are once again uh, using our minds <laughs> to create. And a recent statistic shows that nearly half of, or 60% of U.S. teenagers have created something online, and that's a fundamental fundamental uh, shift in how the mind uh, operates. And I think that's really interesting. Now, at the same time, you know, more relevant to this panel, uh, it creates a scenario where, as has been mentioned, you have you have uh, eight different countries coming together in a in a scenario where one one piece of content is published. Um, again, the reaction: Yikes! What do we do? Uh, how do we how do we react uh, to such a situation? What should we do? And a lot of people ask this question uh, to Google. The, there was a reference made to the article in the in the New York Times from. Uh, uh, Sunday, that long, long piece that I still haven't finished, <laughs> uh, talking about how the three at the top, and I, I spent a, I spent, I'm based in Delhi now, but I spent a year working with those three in California. What do we do? It, and I'm basically here to tell you, we don't know. And, and, the, and the point of saying that is, and I think it's an important first piece of context, is w we at Google, all of us, and especially we at Google, given the popularity of a lot of our services, we're nothing but a bunch of flawed human beings, ultimately. Uh, there is no reason why I, as an employee of Google, should exert more control in what sorts of content is visible, what we take down, what we don't, what we disclose, what we don't. Uh, it's all arbitrary. And it's important to concede that up front uh, because it's all random and arbitrary. We are not specially trained in this, uh, but we happen to be here at this point in time. And, and so that humility, I think, is really important to acknowledge. Uh, so celebrate the world and acknowledge what you don't know. Um, so what do we do? What is, our, um, what is our philosophy? How do we think about uh, content regulation, as I said, and, uh, and privacy? And I'll try to stay as broad as possible, and then at a later point we can take questions. And there are a number, number of other Googlers uh, here in the crowd. And again, I'm not the expert, but I hope to shed, shed uh, some light on how we think about this. Um, you know, what we, what we really have developed at, at Google uh, at our end, and the article shed some light on this, uh, though it was sort of personality specific in some in some respects. Over the years, after after some perhaps uh, arguable mistakes, uh, what we try to do is come up with procedure, clearly defined procedure, uh, as to how we evaluate these questions. Uh, only when you have a a a a procedure that is known internally uh, will your decisions. You want whatever decision decision you make, right? Whether, uh, whether it's right or wrong, whether a million people think it's a good one and two million don't think it's a bad one. You want to know internally that you applied uh, a, a, a consistent set of procedures and, uh, and balance in making that decision. And that's obviously way too conceptual for a lot of you here. here you, want to, you want to know what do you mean? What's your procedure? Um, <laughs> but at a broad level, it's important to know that there are procedures, there is a way of thinking, there is a methodology that goes into some of, these, some of this decision making. But I will say, uh, you know, in all of this, there is a bias towards more information. 
Uh, we are an information company, uh, first and foremost, and, and not just, inf you know, again, preaching to the choir, we, we can sing songs about the value of information and, and its importance uh, to the growth of the human condition. Uh, but, but in addition, you know, our view is innovation. Innovation only happens when, when you are uh, um, standing firm for access and use of information, because only with information can, can economies really grow and can entrepreneurs really have an in incentive incentive to innovate in the first place. Um, I, you know, we can talk about examples of scenarios in which this, is, this has come up, but I, I won't waste time on that right now if you guys have, a lot of them have already been alluded to. We've had, you know, there was a period in my time at Google where it seemed like uh, uh, YouTube was blocked every other week in some country around the world. Uh, other properties of interest are Orkut, which is the, uh, our social networking property, the number one web property uh, here in India, um, and, and in Brazil, of course. Um, and, and many other uh, websites, including Google itself. Um, but I won't go through examples because I think we're all, we're all here. This is a self-selected crowd. But here's the fundamental question. Uh, our general counsel, or deputy general counsel, Nicole Wong, who was quoted in the article, I don't remember if she said this in the article, but you know, when she talks about the internet, she often talks about it's like traveling. If you're sitting in, the, in New York and you visit a website in, a, in, a, in a, another jurisdiction, does it or does it not amount to traveling to that jurisdiction? Um, but e even more fundamentally, the, the second question is the one that I'm, that I'm most interested in. Um, what constitutes presence? What does it mean for, and I'm talking from a Google perspective, what does it mean for an application service provider, which is what Google is, not an ISP, which is what we use, an application service provider, to be present in a country? Because once you answer that question, or once you think about how to answer that question, your decision making follows, right? Because we can all agree, and our CEO says this all the time, we're subject to law. <laughs> you know, if we're present in a country, if we conclude we're present in a country, it's hard for us to avoid uh, legal procedure. It's hard for us to say, we don't obey your law. And so the fundamental, and uh, the first question to answer is what constitutes presence? Um, and uh, you know, what I'll say is, I'll, I'll stay on this slide for a, for a little while. So well, how do we think about this? You know, I, I, can't, I, I, don't, I can't promise to give you the exhaustive list or the way in which we weight these factors, but we think about a lot of things. And I'll, and I'll say first and foremost, we think about users. Do we have, in a particular incident, right, do we have a, a large group of users uh, if it's in uh, Mongolia or in whatever country, do we have a large group of users using a particular product? Now, in our case, that's, a, that's, a <laughs> that's not really a good question to ask because the answer almost always is yes. And so, but we always, we always try to start with user when we think about this question. Uh, another question we ask uh, amongst many is, uh, are we explicitly targeting this product or service in a particular country? And what does it mean to explicitly target? All we, you know, people don't think Google does marketing or advertising, but we do. We do a little bit. Secretly, quietly, you may not notice it, but are we doing something to say, hi, use, uh, use Gmail, or use Google Maps. Google Maps is here. Uh, are, we, are we doing any of that in a particular country? Because if we are, then you know what? We're there. Uh, another, another uh, m to the more obvious uh, criteria, is the product served on a local domain? Are we serving the product on, uh, on .in, .br, uh, .uk, etc., etc.? Again, another question to ask. Another question, because we're a company, uh, is do we have employees on the ground? Um, if we have employees on the ground uh, that, that we are responsible for, ultimately, uh, how, does that, how does that fit, in, fit into this equation? So now, of course, the last two questions, which is employees on the ground, local domain, and, and marketing, you know, a separate question that I'm sure a lot of you will ask is, how do you decide where to, where to, where to promote yourself? Because that's actually the fundamental question. If you want to, uh, China, <laughs> if you want to promote yourself in China, um, does that already uh, expose yourself? Do you already expose yourself to all sorts of difficult questions? So that's a separate question, of course, is how do you make those decisions about where to promote yourself? But if you're talking about presence, those are some of the criteria we think about. Uh, so that's a separate question and leads to complex answers. So then if you are present, 
if you are present, what do you do? So someone says, take down this website. A government official says, take this down. Uh, we don't like it. Or, uh, or a, a, a law enforcement official says, I need, uh, I need this data. Uh, again, we go through the same exercise. We think about uh, we think about a lot of factors that then yields a process. So, what what are the questions we ask? Does content violate our own community guidelines, our own terms and conditions, which are detailed across all of our properties? Uh, do we think about then? We, of course, we begin to think about legal requirements. Think about the laws of our home country, of course, which is the United States. But think about laws of a of a of the local country in question. We think about uh, due process and does, does the country in question, in our judgment, again, as flawed human beings, uh, constitute uh, credible due process. Uh, we think about, I should have said this first, we think about users. What do our users think? What is the user viewpoint on this issue? What do users think about this particular content? What would you, how would our user community react, our ultimate constituency, uh, to these questions about user privacy and censorship and all that sort of thing? Um, and of course, as I said, how would each scenario uh, risk or, or, or not pose a risk to our employees? Again, another important, you know, for a lot of you, it may seem too practical because I know a, a lot of us are idealists who think about human rights, but it's important for us as a company to think about our employees. So again, we, that yields an answer. <laughs> Amongst a group of imperfect people, that process again yields an answer uh, that, that relates to this, uh, this question being asked. Um, now, the problem is today, this is what it looks like. I call it Googzilla, and I should have had about 20 other arrows and logos of 15 other governments in here. But you get the point, which is, you know, and I use the word Googzilla because it's kind of sarcastically, because we occasionally as employees, especially those of us that are attending this conference, feel as though, what are we doing fighting these fights? What are we doing thinking about these questions? We're just employees of Google. Um, and we find ourselves sitting in, in multilateral, bilateral settings when, it, when in fact, uh, it should be other governments in those settings having those same conversations. And the Cybercrime Convention Treaty was, of course, alluded to earlier. And what we need is this. And again, I should have had 20 more arrows and logos of, of 30 more governments. But, but you get my point. What we need is a lot more of this as opposed to Google running around and, 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 uh, and eating up our bandwidth in that way. Again, back to this fundamental question. And what, would we, what we'd ultimately crave, actually, is that question I asked about what constitutes presence. Um, is, Crave is kind of an international, uh, a credible international, I, I won't use the word consensus, because that might just be impossible, but some international point of view that we can then leverage on our own conversations with governments that may be opposed to our, our ultimate decision in such a, in such a scenario. Uh, because without that, we're, we're, we're sort of left defending our own decision making. So I'll stop there, but I will point to what's next. We're, to, we're talking about the transboundary uh, internet in a tran uh, what, and I'll add that, what I'll add is a transboundary trans world. It's important to know that even though the internet is a global medium, governments around the world, of course, are beginning to seed, seed sovereignty on a number of issues. What's next? The transplanetary internet. No, I'm not kidding, and you may have read, read about this, but we have uh, our own Vint Cerf uh, recently participated and worked with NASA on a, on a uh, on, a, on an experiment in which they successfully tested the use of internet technologies to communicate more efficiently and, and in a cost-saving way with people in space. So we may in another few years have a new panel on our hands. So thanks again. I'm happy to answer questions. I didn't cover everything I wanted to, but uh, I, hope, I hope this was at least useful as a primer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rishi. That was, um, that was uh, very, very interesting. And you know, we do live in a world where internet governance happens by default. Because there's nothing in place, what should Google do? And this is the way they've answered it. Is that appropriate? Is this the way that we want the world to be? Well, we're going to get a, another opinion on that from um, Miriam Sapiro. Miriam's the president of Summit Strategies International, but she's worked for um, ICANN, for ITU, for World Intellectual Property Organization, World Trade Organization, a number of these organizations as a consultant. She specializes in internet policy, electronic commerce, and other international issues. And she was, um, as I mentioned, before she worked with the Clinton administration as, as a member of the Obama transition team. So um, I think we've got another excellent speaker to give yet another perspective on this. So over to you, Miriam. 
Uh, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, that was a, a generous introduction. It was way too generous. Let me <laughs> clarify just two things. Um, uh, one is that um, I, uh, I've been active uh, in the Obama campaign, uh, but not on the transition. And, and I want to make clear that my remarks today uh, represent solely my own views and not uh, the views of any organization or, or any client. Um, and while my bio s does say that I've worked um, over the years on issues involving ICANN and the ITU and WIPO, uh, it's been in, in different uh, capacities. I do, for example, uh, some consulting work for ICANN. Uh, I'm an arbitrator for WIPO. Uh, and I've um, worked on ITU issues, though not yet have uh, had the pleasure of working for the ITU. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that uh, uh, as we um, get started here. I'm really delighted to, to be here and, and uh, have the chance to, um, to talk with all of you uh, and my uh, co-panelists on this very, very interesting subject. I uh, started my career as an international lawyer uh, at the State Department in Washington uh, many years ago and still very uh, active in the area now uh, teaching a course on international law. Uh, it's been rotating among NYU Law School, uh, Georgetown, and Columbia School of International Policy. Um, so I, I think these issues really um, can benefit um, from uh, different perspectives, uh, that of the academic community, that of practitioners, um, uh, those uh, from the NGO communities, just to, to name a few of the many different hats that all of us in this room uh, wear from, from time to time and that enrich our perspectives. Let me start um, by perhaps taking a step back and talking um, uh, a bit in my remarks about the big picture and some of the big questions that, that are relevant uh, today. When we um, talk about these issues in the internet context, uh, in some respects the question boils down to think global, act local, or think global, act global. Another way to approach this issue is to consider whether in the first instance, states should be free to regulate the internet within their borders. Or if they shouldn't be free or completely free, does that mean that there shouldn't be any regulation uh, of certain issues? Um, or does it mean that there should only be international regulation, regulation at the international level, level when we talk about questions like cybercrime uh, or privacy or consumer protection? Like, in many, like many other areas of the law, the answer is not black and white. It's really much more in the gray area, as uh, Rishi and Miriam uh, have already uh, illuminated for us. Let me suggest a few ways, uh, a few additional ways that we can try to approach this very complex and interesting subject. First, let's look a little bit at the meaning of jurisdiction, at the meaning of control, and also the meaning of sovereignty. With jurisdiction, uh, it, it's, it's typically defined as the ability or the authority of a state to control something by making laws, by promulgating regulations, um, by developing rules, by developing policies. It doesn't have to be a legal decision, it could also be uh, a political decision. Either because something is happening uh, within a state's borders or because something uh, of concern is happening elsewhere, but has an impact, has an effect uh, within a state's borders. In a classic interstate context, for example, um, pollution uh, is a good example of, of uh, a concern with cross-border impact. So when two countries like the United States and Canada share a very long border, uh, in fact, I think it's the largest undefended border in the world, uh, there are going to be issues uh, that come up of that nature. Now today the challenge is to try to uh, apply them in the internet context. By control, um, by control, 
what do we mean? Is it the ability to enforce rules? Can you as a state exercise control over the situation of concern? You may have jurisdiction over an issue, but you may not have control. And by sovereignty, which is a very uh, uh, important term, but sometimes um, uh, misinterpreted or, or, or construed in different ways intentionally, um, what are we talking about here? Clearly, sovereignty is an attribute of statehood. States, by definition, are sovereign. They have sovereignty. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can control everything within their borders or that they should control everything within their borders. So how do we apply these somewhat different concepts to the, technical, the, the technological marvel of the internet? Some governments today are trying, trying very hard in some cases, to regulate certain aspects of internet activity within their borders, uh, things that they can control, and I think it was Miriam who referred earlier to the Cuba case. Some states are trying to control activities outside of their borders that have an impact within, and the Yahoo case is a good example of that paradigm. And in other cases, states are using emerging international law and international legal norms uh, to govern issues of concern. I think the Cybercrime Convention uh, that was developed by the Council of Europe in 2001, which we heard more about earlier, uh, is a very good example of emerging international law on an internet policy issue. I'd like to make two points uh, about uh, this paradigm. First of all, it's clear, I think, to all of us in this room that there is no classic interstate governance structure. And this is general, generally viewed, I think, as a good development given the multi-stakeholder nature of the internet and how the internet was built and how it's managed today. There are different intergovernmental organizations, such as WIPO, such as the WTO, the ITU, that have a discrete role to play. But no single one has a mandate to, or I think could, try to, quote, manage what we call the internet. Uh, second, many see a risk in having too much regulation. Uh, Google spoke, uh, Rishi spoke a few minutes ago about the importance of innovation. And I want to underscore that. Innovation and competition have been key drivers in the development and the evolution of the internet. The internet's flourished because governments, sometimes by design, uh, sometimes by inertia, have generally avoided unnecessary uh, or excessive regulation. So the question going forward is, when we have serious concerns, and I think cybercrime is an excellent example of such a subject, what can we as the international community do? I suggest uh, two points to consider further. One is, what are mechanisms for strengthening international cooperation? I think forums like the IGF have become incredibly valuable in the last uh, year or so in particular and serve as a very important place where we can discuss these issues among all stakeholders on an equal footing. And the IGF really is unique in that context. Even though the Tunis Agenda for the Information Society set up categories of different stakeholders and suggested different roles that each would play, the issues that we're concerned about today do not break down neatly into these categories. The second step I think we can all take is to consider how to strengthen existing regimes, but to do it on a case-by-case -case basis looking at the particular concern and what the appropriate remedy might be. So, for example, with respect to human rights and fundamental freedoms, there are existing regimes out there, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, to name just two of the most important 
uh, foundations for international human rights law, how can we ensure that those fundamental human rights are being respected in the new context of the internet? And to the extent that they might not be translating easily, is there updating that needs to be done to make sure that new mediums of communication are still respecting uh, existing international law and norms? I think the Cyber Crime Convention is another good example of how we can strengthen existing regimes. In this case, we have a very good foundation, thanks to the Council, but we could have more ratifications. So in other words, is this IGF a forum where we're discussing that treaty, uh, not just in this setting, but in others as well, is that a way that we can bring more awareness to bear on the problem and deal with it in a very constructive way? So in conclusion, I would suggest that we focus on areas where we do have international agreement on the rules of the road and think about whether or not that's sufficient. In cases where it's not, we should consider further what we can do in terms of implementation, in terms of broadening the base, and in terms of, of updating these norms that have stood us well in other contexts. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. And I think with Miriam and Miriam and Rishi, we've um, had a great range of different perspectives here. It's very hard to get in so few people to be able to cover human rights, law, government, um, uh, pri private sector responses, civil society responses and that, you've heard all of that. I'm going to call on Bill Drake to um, make a few comments and I'm very keen to pass over to the floor of, you know, straight after that and uh, you know, have time to get lots of input on that because I think that's very key. But um, Bill is um, uh, here in this panel as a discussant but um, many of you will know Bill Drake. He's at the Centre for International Governance at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Uh, Bill is a prominent writer um, author and speaker on internet governance issues. He's very involved with the Internet Governance Caucus and with the GigaNet Academic Network. So I'm sure Bill's got some great thoughts to provoke us, I hope, and um, to keep us moving on. Thanks, Bill. Thank you, Ian. I'll try to provoke. Um, what I wanted to do is try and integrate some of the points that have been made and maybe put them in a little bit broader context in a way that hopefully will help to stimulate some discussion with the floor. Uh, I'm going to make basically three broad kinds of points. Um, the first concerns the sort of antecedent condition, which is the growing role of the state in the territorialization of cyberspace. Um, we all know that the early techno-libertarians and internet separatists tended to make the argument that technology and freedom justifies essentially being excluded from the reach of sovereign laws. And there was sort of a parallel argument that went on among many political scientists and other social scientists about the retreat of the state in the modern era due to the uh, globalization, the spread of the internet, and so on. The reality, of course, I think, which we've all started to recognize now, is that the state never retreated. Uh, its role has simply evolved. For example, in the United States in the early days, the internet, the role of the government in the internet was as a funder and owner of infrastructure. Uh, but then from 1991, we had the privatization of the backbone and the shift towards a more limited regulatory role where setting rules for copyright, liability, speech, and so on was what became the activity mediating essentially between different parties and trying to promote certain public objectives. From the late 1990s, we've moved towards a, a different kind of stage where the state's playing a much more active regulatory role in the United States, both through the FCC and the courts, vis-a-vis -vis the internet, uh, to promote public policy objectives and to organize markets, i.e., for example, with the creation of ICANN. Um, another dimension of this, though, and this goes to something that Miriam was talking about, was that the state has also become much more actively engaged in surveillance and law enforcement. And in these latter two contexts, then, uh, both the, the sort of uh, increasing regulatory role in organizing markets and the surveillance, what we've seen, as Marion pointed out, was the deputization, deputization of private intermediaries to promote public objectives. So you've got, you've got now a situation where ISPs and, and uh, OSPs are being charged with snooping, uh, data retention, uh, offering traceback and other kinds of things, and extending, uh, often being subject to liability for content. 
uh, as well. Um, ICANN is going through a somewhat similar kind of enhanced role as a deputy of the, of the U.S. state in some ways. So some of these actions raise troubling questions from the standpoint of citizens and the public interest. As the state increasingly becomes more active in these domains, one has to reconsider Larry Lessig's old idea that code is law. Increasingly, law is code. Law is driving the way technical configurations are done in order to meet the requirements of the state. We're seeing more and more stepped up intervention elsewhere, you know, outside the United States by legislatures and courts, applying laws often with extraterritorial spillovers or intent. This is especially true in the OECD region. We've had cases with the United Kingdom and Australia and others with liability claims that extended across borders. Uh, but you can imagine that with time there will be more diversification as transitional and developing countries begin to make similar sorts of claims. And one can expect that that will include authoritarian countries. We've already seen China compel Yahoo to divulge information that led to the...